I hope y'all did a good job singing it too. Why me, Lord? Why me? Most of the time we ask that question, we're, we're not praising the Lord, we're, we're doubting why things have happened to us. It's be good to hear a praise song from the way to choose to bless me. If you got your Bibles open to the book of Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 2, we're going to read four verses. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews said, we are to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we shall let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just a recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And God also bare them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with many miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. It seems to me like we live in a world where everybody's looking for an escape route. How do I escape the millionaire? He's trying to escape paying taxes. And then uh, there's the student. The student's trying to escape all that homework. Truck driver, he's trying to, he, he's trying to escape the radar. Prisoner, he's trying to get out of and escape the cell. The Bible is an escape book. The Bible tells us how to escape certain things in our life. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us here. The Bible tells us how to escape sin and the punishment for sin. The Bible tells us how to escape the chastisement of God's wrath upon Christian people who are not living their Christian life. First of all, how shall we escape if we neglect the person of Jesus Christ? You see, this thing of salvation has always been in a person. It's not in a church. It's not in rituals. It's not going through all the things that Christian people go through. No, that's not where salvation is. Salvation is in one person. It is in a person. And the Bible said that it was revealed by the Lord himself. It was God who revealed himself through Jesus Christ. After the resurrection, that early church was started. Christians began to tell the world. Christians began to tell their neighbors. Christians, every generation, every generation, Though every generation is one generation against all the world becoming atheists. Unless we tell the story, unless we tell the story of Christ and we win people to the Lord, our generation will be the last generation of Christian people upon this earth. So from Jesus up until us, somebody's not broken the chain. An unbroken chain of witnesses has come all the way to me and to you. And somebody, some of those witnesses told us about the Lord. And the, and the Bible said that God had signs of, of salvation. There's three ways he revealed his signs. First of all, he says there's signs and wonders. I thought about that. There's a lot, a lot of, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, about the signs and wonders. There's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that kept the children of Israel cool and warm. There is, when Hezekiah like died, Isaiah came to see him and Isaiah said, you're going to die, buddy. Now, if you were sick, you wouldn't want me to come tell you that, would you? You'd probably do what this king did. He turned his face toward the wall and began to cry, plead with God. As Isaiah started out, God said, go back and tell him. Because of his prayer, I have added 15 years to his life. So when he goes back, the king says, I don't believe it. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. He said, okay. Uh, there's a sundial. It's going to move forward. He said, well, ain't no big deal. It's going to move forward anyway. 
let it move backwards. And the Bible said the sundial moved backwards. But not only was there signs, there was miracles in the New Testament. All the way from the time of Jesus up until now, the miracles of God is in every place, in every county, every town. Somewhere God is working a miracle. But remember, in the New Testament, people would bring those that were sick and lay them out so the shadow of Peter walking by would pass over them and they would be, they would be healed. And he said there would be special gifts that would be given from the Holy Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but I like what James said, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, let them anoint him and pray over him. I believe God still is in the healing business. As a matter of fact, I think most of the healing takes place, and I don't want to take away from the doctors and, the, and medical people, but all healing basically has to come from God, because God's in control of everything. Now, look at what the Apostle John said about this salvation. The Gospel of John in chapter, uh, uh, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 said this, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which was not written in this book, but these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. The Gospel of John was written so you would believe in Jesus Christ. Now, the, now, first John, and y'all Sunday school lessons on this, I thought that was pretty neat. First John was written so you would know that you're saved. Isn't that nice? John kind of gave us a, uh, he gave us a, a kind of a checklist. But first of all, in first John chapter 2, verse 4, he said, there's three checklists. He said, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So first of all, there's a conduct test. Do you act like a Christian? People see you out on Monday morning. Do they, could they identify by your action that you're a Christian? John said that's one checklist. How do you act when you're out of church? But then he said in John 2, 9, He that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. That's a hate test. Is there somebody you hate and a brother in the brotherhood of the church? And then John 2, 19, he said, They went out from us, but they were never of us. For if they had been with us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest they were not of us. That's the endurance test. So John says, uh, John says there's three tests I want to give you, three acid tests. So you can know, and now the devil will do everything in the world he can to confuse Christians and tell them lies about the Lord and about not being saved. John 5, 13 said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you should know that you have eternal life. Say, folks, you ain't saved somewhere out in the future. When you stand before God, you're not saved there. You're saved or lost when you leave this world. The Christian people stand before the God at the great white throne. Not at the great white, white throne, at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're judged for our works. The law stands before God at the great white throne judgment. To get their punishment metered out in hell. Now the question is this. The question is, if we neglect Jesus, if we turn our back on the teaching of the Word, how shall we escape? Now, folks, this thing of salvation is not like getting over. It's just going to happen sometimes. Trust me, you're going, you're going to get over. I'm an expert in it. If you don't take my word, Brother Benny will fill in the gap. It's not like that. Salvation is something that must have in your life a time and an experience fixed to it. Y'all with me now? 
Amen. Remember when you got saved. You may not remember the exact hour. You may not remember the exact day. You may not even remember the year. You may not even remember the preacher or the witness that came to talk to you when you got saved. But do you remember the experience? What happened? When you repented of your sins and the Lord Jesus Christ came into your heart and you have what we call a salvation experience. Now, people... Without Jesus Christ, there's no escape. Without Him, there is no escape. But now the second thing. How shall we escape if we neglect the teaching of Jesus Christ? Jesus said this. He that hears the saying of mine and doeth it, what can I liken to? What can I illustrate with? He said he's like a man that builds his house on a rock. The winds come. The floods come, but it's secure because it's built on a rock. Now, there are several significant things Jesus taught. First of all, he taught lessons of love. He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and thy neighbor as thyself. He taught about loving God and loving man. The idea of a Christian. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Then he talked about faith. All faith must be in him. Everybody, has, even atheists has faith. They believe in their own silly way of thinking. The heathens have faith. Some are worshiping in the sun or the moon. But all faith must be in Jesus Christ. That bridge is a, a, builds a bridge to him and to God. Then he taught about faithfulness. In Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calls you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. How long are we supposed to be faithful to church? How long are we supposed to be diligent in our Christian life? How long are we to attend? How long are we to give? The Bible says a lifetime. Be faithful unto death. It is God's measure stick. When we stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ, His measurement will be how faithful we were to Him will the gifts of the Holy Spirit administer us when we got saved. Let me, let me illustrate this. So it's the judgment seat of Christ. Up steps a great, well-known preacher. He's won thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. And he stands before the Lord. And we are all in expectation. We know what he's going to say. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. But up steps this little old lady. At least she used to be a little old lady. She ain't never done any great things for the Lord. She was a widow on earth from the time she was 35 years old. Husband killed in the war. All she ever done was take her Bible and go to church. Her Bible got all stained up from tears. She sat there, she could not teach. She couldn't, she couldn't pray all that good in public. And she, but she was there every Sunday. She stand before the Lord. What are we expecting to say? Do we expect to say, well, now let me see here. What can we do for you? No, you know what he said? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. God does not use the measure stick that the world uses. How faithful we are to God with, and how do we use the gifts that God has given us. We have in the Bible a parable of Jesus about the talents. And I won't go into all that. You remember he gave one one, he gave one two, and he gave the other one five. When he came back, and that's symbolic of Jesus coming back, when the good man who owned the vineyard came back, he found the one who had one hit it. The one had two, double it. One had five, double it. And he, he was not pleased with the one who took it and hid I hear people say all the time, I don't have a gift. I'm telling you, you have a gift. You have a gift. 
the best thing we can do is discover what gifts we got and not be shy about it. And use them for the glory, glory of God. And then, how shall we escape if we neglect the church of Jesus Christ? When we talk about churches, we talk about it on two levels. There is one sense, the universal church, which everybody that's been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to the universal church. Y'all with me now? Doesn't matter if it's Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholic. Doesn't matter about all that. If they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're part of the universal church. But that universal church breaks down onto local congregations. Now, folks, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where the Word of God goes on. And that's what he's talking about here. The Word that if we neglect the church... What did it cost to establish the church? Jesus had to become lower than the angels for a while, down the cross for our sins. And the Bible said he died for the church. And the, gate, the great characteristic of the church is love, that we have love for one another. Look what he's done to me. I heard folks say, well, church ain't never done nothing for me. Folks, the church done everything for you. Amen. There would not be any hospitals was it not for the church. There would not be any nursing homes if it was not for the church. The good life you're enjoying now, you would not have it had it not been for the love of the Lord manifested through the local congregation. It gives us strength, encouragement. If you're down and out, you come to church, you get encouraged. There's fellowship. There's people that love you. People that care about you. You're not just a number on the board. You're a person they care about. And then look at the teaching he revealed to man. His part in the world. I got a part in the world to come. I think that's what some, every one of us have. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. The determining what we are going to do. In the church we get a glimpse of our work. What made the church so attractive? In Bible times, 60% of all the world were slaves. The church gave the first vision of what it would be to be free. The church said to them, you are somebody. You're not a piece of equipment. You're somebody. God loves you. And you're important to the Lord. How shall we escape if we neglect the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? But finally, how shall we escape if we let slip what we've been taught? You meet people all the time. You all went to church all the time when there was a boy. And now they're either lost or backslid. What happened? What happened? The teachings is important. What you've heard as a child, what you've heard as a young person, what you've heard all your life is important. God said to the children of Israel when they got in camp, God said to them, be careful. Lest after you've walked across on dry ground and you saw the water up here and you saw the water banked up here and you walked through to Canaan on dry ground. And not only that, not only as he parted the waters, but as you lived in the wilderness, manna coming down every day to feed you. Your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes grew as you grew. Once you come in and you started running off the Canaanites, you started feasting on those great, huge grapes. You started living in a land that was flowing with milk and honey. God said, beware, lest when you do this, you will slip away from God. Prosperity is the greatest enemy the church has. Amen. Prosperity, people have the uh, thinking, well, I'm doing all right. I've got a good job. I can make it. I can do all right. And somehow or other, that slips out of our mind. It's all because of God. 
It is all because that God is blessing us. Every blessing you have has come from God. How did it come by? Remember that what Jesus did on the cross that you and I could have eternal life. He suffered humility on the cross that you and I might be born again. Not only did He suffer for that, but He suffered that one day you and I could move in to glory. Amen. Can you imagine how beautiful that place is going to be? Paul said, I have not seen, there is not heard, nor has entered into the hearts of men the things God has prepared for those who love Him. He is indeed the captain of our soul. And that idea of Him being the captain of our soul, and the Bible writer is using this, when the Romans went out on a campaign and they conquered a nation, they would take the king of that nation and the leaders of that nation and their armies and they'd have a celebration in Rome, a victory celebration. And they'd march all the people before. First would come the army of Rome. All cheers would go up. Then would come the defeat foe. Their heads down. The arms and chains, the feet, the feet, the feet. You know, we were like that before Jesus saved us. Amen. When Jesus came, He defeated our enemy and He made us free, free, free. Amen. Jesus told a parable. Let me close with this. Jesus told a parable of a rich farmer. The Bible said not only was he rich, he started, he was getting even richer. His crops just absolutely undone. They, they were just tremendous. And he said, now, what am I going to do with all this, all these goods? He probably had a little bitty barns. But he was progressive in his thinking. He was a crafty businessman. He said, I'm going to tear those down. I want to get them out of the way and I'm going to build huge barns. Huge barns. And I'm going to put all my goods in those barns. Well, I'm going to pack them full. I'm going to have them totally full. And when I get them full, I'm going to look at them and I'm going to rejoice. And I'm going to say to my soul, so you've got goods laid up for many years. Take that ease, eat, drink, and be married. Boy, that sounds great, don't it? Going to get to retirement. Hey, man, I've been 30 years old. I'm going to retire. I'm going to, I'm going to, I am going to live it up. But you know what he forgot? He forgot about where it came from. You know what God said to him? God said to him, God said to him, this night, this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, who? You know what's important in life? Our closeness to Jesus Christ. I believe the closer you get to Him, the more He blesses you. Does that make sense? That's not saying you're not going to ever have any disappointments and hard times and all that. that. That's a common lot to all people. But over the long haul, God blesses us because of what we do for Him. Let's pray together. Dear Lord God, thank you, Father that you love us. Lord, how can we live in a universe where God didn't love us? Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for sending Christ to die for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for sending the church to give us all the good things we have today. Thank you for the great meaning of the Bible that the Bible talks about, Lord. And thank you for the millions and millions of unnamed saints of God that in their day and in their time and in their generation. Lord, they made a difference in the world. Now, Lord, you pushed us to the forefront. And God, now it's our time in this world to do what we can do. And God, help us to be able to pass it on to the other generations that come. And they might share in, uh, share in the heavenly home that we're looking to go to. Now, Lord, I pray today, if there's anyone here that needs to make a commitment or a decision, I pray, God, as we sing the invitation song, God, it would, you would bring them down the aisle for us to do Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?
Thank you.